Hi everyone, in this video of Accelerated Chess Dragon, we're going to be doing something different. I decided to go over some openings, and this is the Scotch Gambit. So, let's look at this opening. White will start the game by playing e4, and now we have e5 by black, so quite normal. Knight f3, knight c6, and instead of going for moves like bishop c4 or bishop b5, white is going to play the move d4. And after d4 is played, um, black can go for many different options. Uh, he could go for d6, uh, he could go for e takes d4. In this opening, we're going to be looking at e takes d4. And after e takes d4 is played, you could capture the pawn back, but instead, white is going to be playing bishop c4. And he's just not going to be concerned about the material, and he's just going to be continuing his development like he didn't just give up a pawn. So here, black has three main moves. You can play bishop b4 check, bishop to e7, or bishop to c5. We're going to be looking at bishop c5 first, because I believe it's the biggest sideline of the other two moves, bishop e7 and bishop c5. So, after bishop c5 is played, and this is true no matter which move you play, whether it's bishop e4 or bishop e7 or bishop c5, you are going to be playing the move c3. And the point of c3 is to try to either capture the d4 pawn, or force black to capture your pawn, and then something bad will happen to him. So let's look at the options that black has. Black can either play the move d3, or d takes c3. And both moves are okay, but we're going to be looking at d takes c3 first. After d takes c3, white is going to take advantage of the fact that the c5 bishop is undefended. And he's going to do that by playing bishop takes f7 check. And after king captures, you play queen d5 check. And um, here, black could go king f8, he could also go king e8, um, but in this, in this case, we're going to show king e8. Queen takes c5, um, regaining the piece, and okay, black could play c takes b2 and get another pawn, but that's not going to be the best idea since it'll just give you more development, so it's highly recommended that you do not play that move. So queen e7 by black, uh, just trying to trade more pieces off. And now queen takes e7, knight g takes e7, developing the last piece. And note that Black is not doing this because he wants to castle, since he practically cannot castle. He already moved his king to f7 when he captured that bishop, so really what he's doing is just trying to develop all of his other pieces. We have knight takes c3, and now Black is going to play d5. And okay, um, after e takes d5, knight b4, um, white actually has a very nice idea, and uh, it's very amusing to me, uh, in my opinion. So, white is actually going to be playing bishop g5. And best for black is actually to capture the pawn, and not worry about winning the exchange. Because if black plays knight c2 check to try winning the exchange, then he actually just went from equal to lost. And this is how. White is going to punish this move by playing king to d2. And after king d2, you're practically forced to capture the rook. If you don't, then you're going to lose this knight, or if you try to save it with knight before, then either rook coming to e1 can just win that e7 knight. Uh, there's no way from that knight on b4 to defend this knight on e7. So, knight takes a1, and now rook e1. You don't capture the a1 knight, because that allows black to escape with king f7, or he could just simply play king d7. The point is that he's able to get away from the trap that white is going to set. So, you must play rook e1. And after rook e1, that knight on e7 simply cannot be protected. So, you must give it up by playing bishop f5. This is by far um, one of the best moves. Uh, you could also go for h6 to try forcing the bishop to capture, but then again, it's still quite bad, no matter how you put it. So, bishop f5, rook takes e7 check, and now you have to go to f8. Because if you go to d8, then rook f7 check, 
will win the f5 bishop. And that knight on a1, it's not going to get out. You're simply going to play king c1, king b1, and then you win the knight. So you don't want to do that. So black is going to play king f8. And now, how do you activate the rook on h8? After rook takes c7, yes, white is down the exchange, but what is black going to do? I mean, black is up the exchange, true, but how is he going to take advantage of it? I mean, he's not even able to activate his rook. So, being up the exchange here is practically pointless for black, and white is easily going to win this uh, with no trouble at all. Instead of playing d takes c3, black also could play the move d3. And if you play d3, um, you're not actually going to capture that pawn immediately as white. Yes, you can capture it, but that pawn is practically going nowhere. So you can capture it whenever you want. So white is going to play b4, attack the bishop, and now bishop b6. The bishop stands best on this diagonal, so uh, you might as well put it there. And now you're not going to capture the pawn yet again. You're going to play a4. And the point of a4 is to try to trap the bishop with a5. But black is, of course, not going to allow that, and he's going to play a6. And um, a5 could also be played, but then white would just play b5 and attack the c6 knight. So a6, bishop takes d3 by white. Um, you could capture with the queen, but uh, capturing with the bishop uh, comes with a really important reason. After d6, you castle, knight f6. Uh, normal development, knight pd2, black castles, and now knight c4. The main reason why you played bishop takes d3. To give the c4 square for the knight. And after this, white should be better. So, let's look at what happens if instead of bishop c5, you go for bishop to e7. Well, if bishop e7 is played, then like I said, you're going to play c3. And c3 is going to be played no matter what move is played uh, between bishop b4 check, bishop e7, and bishop c5. So black has two moves. He could go knight f6, or he could go d takes c3. And let's look at knight f6 first. If knight f6 is played, white is going to continue with e5, attacking the knight. The knight's going to go to e4, um, bishop d5, and now knight c5, just trying to remaneuver the knight. C takes d4 now, attacking the knight on c5, and after knight e6, you play knight c3. You're done with most of your development, and surely enough, you should have the advantage. There's another move for black, which is d takes c3. And d takes c3 might at first be like a bad move, because white has queen d5, and how do you stop checkmate? The only real good move is knight h6, right? Because, I mean, you, you obviously don't want to play d6, because this is going to lead to checkmate in 2. King d7, and then bishop e6 is mate. So, how do you really parry that threat? Well, you're actually just going to play knight h6. And at first, this seems bad, because you're losing ma material, right? I mean, if the bishop takes h6, you can't capture the bishop, because you get mated. But... You can just castle, and after you castle, white doesn't really have a way of keeping his extra piece. For example, we can see that if white moves the bishop to a wrong square, then there is this option of c takes b2, and after that the rook is practically lost. But, how else do you stop it? You could play bishop c1, which is okay, but after knight b4, there's a threat of not only knight c2 check, but if you play queen d1, there is c2, and now let's say you play queen e2, c takes b1, you can promote to whichever piece, and after rook takes b1, black is up a pawn, you should stand better here, and um, it's hard to say what white's advantage really is. In fact, white doesn't have an advantage. I mean, black has completed his development, which is the one thing you don't want him to do in a lot of gambit lines. So you're not going to play bishop c1. Instead, you're going to capture this pawn on g7. And after king captures g7, knight takes c3. Even though you are not up a piece anymore, 
it's debatable whether castling kingside was actually a good idea for black. And uh, the point is, is that his kingside structure is completely stripped away. And after white castles queenside, pushes the pawns, he should have a good attack and um, it could be an easy win for him. So, that was bishop e7. Now let's look at the main move, bishop b4 check. And after bishop b4 check, you are going to play c3. And after d takes c3, b takes c3 will be played. You don't play knight takes c3. Knight takes c3 is playable, but it's not the right variation we want. Because after knight takes c3, you allow black to consolidate. And he can play something like knight f6, knight g7. He's able to consolidate his position. Uh, he's going to get rid of that knight on c3. And after he castles, it's not really clear what your advantage is. So you're not going to play knight takes c3. You're going to be playing b takes c3. And here, black most likely should play bishop a5. Um, if he plays any other square, then it's going to lead into something bad. Um, bishop e7 is going to run into queen d5. And now it's a bit different. Um, you don't have knight h6. Uh, bishop takes h6, castles, and then forcing white to take on g7 because there's a threat on the rook on B2, on b2 because there's no pawn on c3 anymore so now you are basically losing a piece you must play knight h6 and after bishop h6 you must castle how do you defend you white will just play bishop e3 and he's up a piece so black cannot go for bishop e7 let's look at a few other moves if you go bishop c5 bishop takes f7 check king takes f7 and now queen d5 check so what do you do here? Uh, you must play king back to f8 or king e8, and then queen takes c5 just wins, right? Yeah, there's not really much to do here. So it's hard to really get an exact bishop square that it needs to go to. Bishop d6 blocks the d-pawn in, and bishop f8 is practically pointless. I mean, why did you just bring the bishop out to b4 and then bring it back to f8? That's hindering your development, so... Black must play bishop a5, and after bishop a5, white is just going to castle, d6, black must continue developing, queen b3, and here black is going to be playing the move queen e7. This is the main move. There are two other moves that you can play. One is queen f6, and one is queen to d7. We're going to look at queen d7 first. Um, if you play queen d7 as black, white is just going to go bishop to g5, and here this branches out a bit more. Um, black has two moves. You can play knight f6 or f6. Uh, if he goes for f6, then there is bishop takes g8, and after f takes g5, uh, very nice idea, bishop takes h7. And the point of bishop takes h7 is that if you capture this bishop on h7, then this queen will come to g8, and, well, you're going to win the exchange, essentially. So, you can't do that. There's also the option of playing knight to f6, but after knight f6, e5, and the position gets opened up. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5, d takes e5, and now rook d1, and after queen g4, bishop takes f7 check. In black's king side is getting completely busted, and white is getting a attack. It's so strong that it's really hard to say what black can do here. So, white would definitely stand better here. And hence, queen d7 is not really the best move. You also have the option of playing queen f6. But if queen f6 is played, the same idea. Bishop g5, and after queen g6, e5. You're going to try to continuously open the position up. And d takes e5 must be played here. Um... If you go for knight takes e5, then after knight takes e5, d takes e5, queen b5, check. Um, let's say now you play c6. Um, there is the option of playing queen takes e5, check. And, um, well, white is just getting too much initiative, and this is not going to be good for black. So, it's best not to play knight takes e5. So... 
Instead, you could go for the symbol d takes e5. There's also the option of playing f6, but after bishop g8, fg5, and bishop d5, I mean, black is not able to castle, so this is hard for black to play anything. So instead, just d takes e5, and now you just play rook fe1. You're targeting the e5 pawn. Um, knight g7 can be played, but there's also another move, which is e4. And yes, this uh, variation has a lot of uh, branching out lines, so just bear with me here. You're going to play bishop d5 as white, and you're threatening the e4 pawn. So black is going to defend with knight f6, and it is true that you could play bishop f6 and then you win a pawn. Um, after queen or g takes f6, you can play rook takes e4 check. But even better is bishop c6 check, and after bc6, a very nice idea, knight e5. And the point of knight e5 is that if you capture this bishop on g5, you abandon the defense of this f7 pawn. And uh, it's actually just checkmate in 2 after king d8 and knight takes c6. So you must not go for that. You must play queen h5. And after queen h5, white is going to capture on f6. G takes f6. And after knight takes c6, it doesn't matter that white is down a pawn you can see that he has five pawns whereas black has six because here the only thing that really matters is black's pawn structure and if you consider this almost all of his pawns are isolated this is the only one that isn't um this is the only pawn that isn't isolated all of these other pawns they're all isolated one one uh, two pawns are even doubled and uh, this is hard for black to even play. I mean, his, his king side is just stripped apart, and how does he continue from here? It's very hard to say. So it's not really an easy position to play, uh, as we see. Uh, if you go e4, you could go knight g7, but then there's bishop e7, and if you play knight takes e7, then there's knight takes e5. And this is crushing for white. He's winning this f7 pawn, he might get queen b5 check ideas in, and black has absolutely no counterplay just because he didn't castle earlier. So, that is essentially how you play against queen to f6. But there is another move, and that's queen e7. If you go for queen e7, however, then white's not going to play bishop g5, like in the previous two lines, but he's going to go e5. And he's going straight for the king's heart. D takes e5. Since knight takes e5 is playable, but playing a position where you're completely exposing your king. Let's say knight takes e5. And, um, well, if d takes e5 is played, then there's actually queen b5 check or queen a4 check uh, winning this bishop on, on a5. So you must play queen takes e5. Um, I mean true this is okay this is holdable but after bishop f7 king f8 i mean how many people would play a position where their king is completely exposed and you don't know what to do i i bet no one would so queen takes e5 is out of the question knight takes e5 is out of the question so why why would you go for this um instead black will play d takes e5 and this opens up the a3, f8 diagonal for white to give his bishop a very nice square. Queen f6 will be played, and now knight bd2. Um, the point of knight bd2 is to bring this knight to e4, and then simply just continue from there. Knight g7, knight e4, attacking the queen. The queen goes to g6. Um, the queen really needs to keep an eye on this f7 pawn. Because if it's not, then it's hard to say whether black will come out in one piece. So bishop e7. And now, best is queen takes e4. We're going to be looking at a few sidelines that black can play in this position. Um, the first one is what happens if you play knight takes e7. Um, if knight takes e7 is played, then white is going full on to attack the king. He's playing knight takes e5. And... Um, here, you would have to either move the queen to f5 or some square uh, to defend the f7 pawn, 
or you could go for queen takes e4, but this is actually completely losing for black because white has bishop b5 check. And after this, it's hard to hold the position. Um, you can see like c6, then there's queen f7 check, king d8, rook a d1, or even rook f d1. Um, both will work. And after king c7, queen e7 check. Um, I mean, how are you going to hold this position? You're not down material as black, but it's it's just like there's no way to actually play. I mean, you're practically forced to giving up your queen after king b8. Since if you go for king to b6, then there's the option of playing knight c4 check, and you win the queen. Uh, let's say king takes b5 and just knight d6 check. Even rook b1 check is enough, but... White has so many ways to play this position that it doesn't even matter. The impact on black is the same no matter what white plays. So, it's hard to say what black can really play after bishop b5 check. So, knight takes c7 is usually not a considered possibility. Um, instead, you have the option of playing king takes e 7 But this allows queen a3 check. The king must go back to e8. And now knight eg5. So... Of course, you're threatening bishop f7, winning the queen. So black will play rook f8. He's ready to give up a rook for two pieces. Bishop b5 will be played. And um, the point of bishop b5 is white is now threatening queen takes a5 since this knight is pinned. So black plays bishop back to b6. You play rook a e1. And after f6 is played, white just completely will crush black with this move. And I encourage you to pause the video and try finding out what move white can play, which after which black should practically resign. Okay, so white should play the move knight takes e5. And after this move, black has nothing. Let's say that he captures the knight on e5. Well, then there's rook takes e5 check, because this knight's not really defending the pawn. And here, it's simply there's nothing to do. If you go king d7, this is checkmate. The knight is still pinned. It's really not doing anything. A pinned piece is not really doing its job. So, what do you have after knight takes e5? Well, nothing. You practically have to resign. I mean, you're getting crushed here. So, it doesn't really help to capture with the king either. Both ways of capturing the bishop are actually just exposing your king a lot more. So best is just queen takes e4, and after rook f e1 attacking the queen, queen f5, bishop a3, this is the end of the variation, and this is the end of the entire opening. After all of this, white just stands better. He's not allowing black to castle kingside, and he's not allowing him to castle queenside by doing something like developing this bishop to d7, because there are options like queen takes b7, and, well, how does black defend all of this? It's just a very dynamic opening, and this is another reason why I chose this opening. It's just so dynamic, and it's, it's so deep, and there are many different variations and many different ways that your opponent can go wrong if he does not know this opening. So I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please let me know in the comment section, and stay tuned for more chess.